before we get to our action item this evening, I would just like to um, to say a few things. Um, on behalf of our administration and our school board, I would like to thank our Quaker Valley community for their patience as we navigate through this unprecedented time. As we embark on this school year, I assure you that our administration, staff, and volunteers in our subcommittees have been working to ensure the safety of our students, teachers, and staff. This situation is continuously changing, and we face new challenges daily. Along with the safety of our children, we want to ensure that each child's needs are met academically, socially, and emotionally. Mike Lewis, Director of Student Services, will be working closely with each family who has a child in special education. With their teachers, parents will discuss their goals and will continue to be there each step of the way. With so many restrictions in place, please be patient as they work to find the best way to work with your child. Karen Dabda, Director of Innovation and Strategic Initiatives, has been working to offer our teachers continued professional development, which will assist them in carefully planning and implementing our curriculum so that our children receive an engaging learning experience. Our teachers are dedicated to our children. As we move forward, I ask that we offer grace to our administration, teachers, and staff as we begin this year. Educating our children and keeping them safe are the most important priorities. We are navigating through uncharted waters. This has been a difficult time for our families as well as our administrators. Our lives have been disrupted, but we are committed to providing our families and students the support they need. I would also like to commend Dr. Andrego, Dr. Surla, Dr. Gentile, and my fellow board members who have been working tirelessly to lead Quaker Valley through this pandemic. Our children are our number one priority. Thank you to our subcommittees who have worked alongside our administration, staff, and board members to consider how to safely open schools for our students. As the administration presents this plan to you tonight, the community should know that the full document is available online through board docs and after tonight on our website and submitted to PDE. It should be noted that this is the first significant work that must be completed before academic options are offered to the school board. Those recommendations will follow our vote this evening on the health and safety plan. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Andrego. Thank you very much, Ms. Selskowski. As a, as a mom, as a sister, as a daughter, as an aunt, this is very important to me as a person, but I also think we have a true empathy, everyone on our staff, as we get ready for tonight and the way we have been really working as a community, as a country, together as we look to reopening of our schools. So tonight I proudly share with you this phased in plan and share with you that this will not be the only revision that you will see. You will see revisions along the way. Um, we, we even anticipate more guidance this week um, from either the Department of Health or then from other groups. And so we must adjust and modify as necessary. We are grateful to have so many people online with us tonight. From the onset, let me share with you that we are grateful for your patience and support and ultimate kindness. The direct impact on schools is very, very important. And tonight's health and safety plan with you and our school board will give us the guidance that we need to move forward. I might say to you that this glass is half full tonight because we're talking about coming back to school and staying in school and revitalizing our educational process. We know that there are different opinions, different research, politics, but we are committed to doing everything we can to meet the diverse needs of our students to the best of our ability. Our goal has always been to reopen in person, but we are realistic that the pandemic pushes and pulls our decisions and our reactions. Therefore, you will notice transitional planning that offers support and decisions to our families and for our families, but you'll also notice that we have to make a change occasionally based upon um, the decision of what's happening within our government or decisions from our governor. We had several goals as we moved into this project, and I like this graphic because it says your kids and our kids, because we really see it that way, because we, we like to think of Quaker, Quaker Valley as one big family. Our goal is to safely bring our students and staff back to school, and tonight to outline the safety measures and mitigation strategies for a safe on-campus learning environment, and to provide families with options to meet those educational needs along with us. We will have different presenters tonight who will share the different stages of work we have done this summer and our commitment to welcome our staff back and your students for 2021. 
I also want to acknowledge the other Quaker Valley employees who have helped us during this session tonight and many of you who wear a hat both professionally and also as a parent. We are indeed all in this together, but in order to do that, we have to outline safety measures and mitigation strategies for safe on campus returning. Finally, we understand that current conditions do not allow for a one size fits all. Many school districts have presented plans and maybe they've retreated and changed them. Other school districts haven't had their meetings yet. So we are all in this together with 42 school districts in Allegheny County. We may be similar in some ways, but difference in others. So our final goal is to provide you with options and know that we are constantly thinking about your children's safety. We have a few guiding principles that I'd like to share with you tonight. And first of all, all of our work is governed by policies and guidelines that are given to us. Does this protect the personal and physical safety of our students and staff? We must ask ourselves that question every time. What are we doing to support the educational well-being of our students and staff? And how do we create equitable access and opportunities throughout our district? How do we use the professional literature and the information that we have to do the best practice of education that we can? And how will we look at student achievement, perhaps differently than we did last spring? And what capacity do we have to implement and also sustain the strategies and the information that we have to share with you tonight? We welcomed over 50 volunteers to serve on subcommittees that guided our work over the last month. Thank you, and we'll share those names with you later on. We've had the process documents given to us related to policies, guidelines, recommendations. Some were very easy to process, while others were complicated, and today they've become even more complicated. The targets have shifted. Safety is paramount. Thank you to the healthcare professionals in our district who have also guided our thinking, provided literature for us, and made calls and sent emails and kept us on our toes. We are very fond and committed to a full in-person program, so we've continued to push ourselves to offer robust learning opportunities to maximize student learning, but we have to wait to see what is appropriate for Quaker Valley right now. And finally, what is our ability to sustain multiple options in a learning environment that thrives with concerts and conversations, collaboration, interaction, and much more? That's what makes Quaker Valley so special. We have to figure out what school will look like for us right now. It may be different for a time being. Therefore, the details to make this a meaningful remote process is always on our mind. The health and safety plan as we shared is a compliance document that goes to the Pennsylvania Department of Education and we would have done it anyway um, because it is very important for us to take and um, solidify that information for families and also for our faculty and staff. I mean, it really has to be a guiding document. The next slide, please. This is just a statement from the Department of Education that explains what a health and safety plan is and I will turn it over to Dr. Surloff to, um, to guide some of this work. I will share with you as part of this document, um, the district has to um, determine who will be the pandemic coordinator and Dr. Surloff is serving in that capacity, therefore, therefore he will start our conversation this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Andreco. As was mentioned, uh, we were given a task by the Department of Education to put together a health and safety plan for the Quaker Valley School District, as were all schools in the state. Um, but as was mentioned, we would have obviously wanted to put a robust plan together anyway. So when we sat down and began the planning process, one of the first decisions that was made was that we wanted this to be not just an administrative process, but a stakeholder-led process. So we put subcommittees together with approximately 50 stakeholders of community members, medical professionals, administrators, faculty members, staff members, so that we had comprehensive feedback from those participating as this plan was put together. What we're gonna talk about this evening are what took place during those subcommittees, what their goals were, and what their strategies were as they helped to inform the phased school reopening health and safety plan. Uh, one of the first things that was done is that initial surveys were sent to families and to faculty and staff to help inform the process. And then once again, before there was a final even revision up until, as one mentioned at this meeting, a follow-up family return to school survey and faculty survey was also sent so that we could see the change in that data in one month's time. As you can imagine, the changes in the actual pandemic we saw influenced the survey results we received, 
when we did the second follow-up survey. So we're going to start this evening with regard to the survey is discussing how the survey data informed our work. What was the purpose of these surveys and what did this information do for us in our planning? The first thing, and probably the most important to understand, we are not utilizing majority decision making. Health and safety data and guidance will be the determining factors in making decisions as to how we reopen our schools. We all want return to in-person learning. So regardless of what the majorities were in those surveys, 100% of everybody on the school board, on the faculty, on the administration would like to see a return to in-person learning when it is safe to do so. Those preliminary surveys informed some of the committee recommendations. And then we were also interested to see in the preliminary data what things were we looking at with regard to bus ridership? What preferences did families have for online learning? Did they want that online learning to be synchronous? Did they want that online learning to be anytime at their convenience? We needed to understand those numbers. We were also interested in input on distancing and safety measures. As was mentioned, we've had several organizations provide guidance, including those we are bound by in the state of Pennsylvania through the Department of Ed and Departments of Health. And those measures are not always uh, necessarily aligned in terms of how many feet of distancing is needed and what is safe. And so we needed to have our own stakeholders let us know what their own uh, um, thoughts are, shall we say, on what they feel safe with with regard to physical distancing. And of course, we wanted feedback from families and faculty on remote learning from this past spring. We learned a lot of lessons uh, from what we had to do. We basically went from in-person learning to full 100% remote in six days. So if you think about that, that is a pretty large undertaking. And we learned a lot of lessons. And we learned a lot of ways that we'd like to see the improvement to that program going forward should we need a return, to a return to remote learning either in part or in full. So this is just an example, these next few slides, of some of the data results that we received from the most recent survey. So, and this is really important because when we talk about how we're going to offer in-person instruction or how we're gonna offer online instruction, we need to know how many students want these options? What kind of staffing are we looking at? What kind of resources do we need? Is there an opportunity to have in-person instruction and online instruction live with Quaker Valley teachers? We know that the number one thing our community has shared with us is that regardless of the mode of instruction, it is preferable to have that instruction being done by a Quaker Valley teacher. So we need these numbers to help inform that and so that we understand the staffing and the resources that we're going to need to have on hand. So when you look at this, I can tell you that we gave different options to all levels. So the elementary had certain options, middle school and high school, based on what was feasible for us to be able to offer. So in the elementary slide, you can see 70% would like to see some return to in-person. 24% would like to see that live synchronous instruction. And we still have a percentage of families that would like to see an asynchronous option so that they can learn at any time of the day. The middle school is the only building based on the most recent survey that was given the option of in-person and hybrid at the same time. And the reason for that is because we believe we could offer an in-person option given the size of the middle school and the ability to socially distance, but also wanted to know how many families don't want to come back full time, but want to come back part of the time, hence the hybrid. So you can see those percentages as well. Those were the percentages of what people wanted to see uh, if possible with regard to middle school. And then the high school, we only gave a hybrid option, and we're going to talk about that more. But basically, even at about 70% of capacity, 
the high school is an unsafe place for physical distancing. The classrooms are not large enough. The hallways are not wide enough. There are no auxiliary spaces like in the other school buildings. So for example, LGIs, auditoriums where the seats retract like in the middle school, there are no other large auxiliary spaces in the high school. So the classrooms themselves, even at 70% capacity, even at 50% capacity, we would struggle to get to even three feet, let alone six feet of physical distancing, which is why the hybrid was the only option given for the high school. Another important piece of information was how we may physically distance on school transportation vehicles. And our survey tells us that 73% of our families K-12, that varies from grade to grade from about 66% in some to 82% in others, but it averages 73% of families report being able to transport children both ways to and from school. We believe that when and if we return, that should significantly help physical distancing on school vehicles. As I mentioned, when we moved into the planning phase, we had several stakeholders involved in the subcommittees that took part in helping to put this plan together. The Department of Education had a requirement for three committees that the districts in Pennsylvania must have, but Quaker Valley identified three others that we believed were very important in thinking about a health and safety plan for our students and for our returning faculty and staff. So we had cleaning and sanitation, social distancing, which was actually two separate committees because the elementary and secondary plan looks a little bit different. And then we had a student staff health and wellness. Those were all the required. And then we added three additional transportation and community partnerships because our school vehicles travel to the YMCA, they travel to other schools, they travel to other daycare centers. It was important to make sure we were making those community connections. As mentioned, we wanted to have a committee completely focused on remote learning and what instruction would look like in a remote setting and looking at the options that we may return to. Dr. Gentile will be speaking at length this evening about the work that that committee has done. And then finally, social and emotional wellness. We understand that this pandemic, this situation has been very difficult on our children. And we understand that we need to really be focused and be very intentional and thoughtful about their social and emotional needs, both because they've been away from the social interaction that school provides, but also because when they return to school, what they remember school being like is going to look different. And so we need to be attuned to those things so that we can meet the needs of our children. There's an asterisk at the bottom that says athletics and activities. So while that wasn't a specific subcommittee, the district was tasked with putting a health and safety athletic plan together, which was approved in June. There is a small revision to that plan that is subsumed in this Quaker Valley phased health and safety plan. And we also put some guidelines together for student activities. And there is a sample activity plan from the high school marching band, which outlines what a safety plan could look like for an activity as robust as marching band. So the first committee was cleaning, sanitizing, and ventilation. So what we're going to do this evening is this is going to be an overview of what is in that 65-page document. If you go into the document on the website, you'll see all the intricate specifics of all of the work that these committees have done. These slides will be an overview of the major things that the committees attended to as questions to be answered, as requirements to be met, and also strategically what kind of things were they looking at. So, Obviously, cleaning, sanitizing, disinfecting, and ventilating learning spaces and other areas that will be used by students and staff. Routine sanitation of our high traffic and touch point areas during school hours, separate from a thorough sanitation effort that would occur in the evenings. Ventilation, so needing to upgrade filters, so to make sure we have higher MERV 
filters, I learned that word from Mr. Goche. Um, adjustments to HVAC systems to ensure we can maximize fresh air, to make sure that we can filter the air as best we can, particularly in ways that uh, eliminate contaminants from the air. Ensuring training for all custodial staff in accordance with these new standards and protocols and making sure we have signage in all of our schools that are reminders and advisories with regard to face coverings, hand hygiene, and the messaging necessary to make sure we are enhancing safety for all students and staff, as well as maintaining appropriate distancing. <clears throat> Social distancing and programs, as mentioned, was actually two separate committee efforts. There was an elementary committee and a secondary. And the reason for that is strategically speaking, we are looking at two separate strategies with regard to the elementary versus the secondary program. So the elementary strategy, the one that we will utilize for social distancing at the elementary level is something referred to as cohorting. And what that basically means is students will stay in their homeroom for a majority of their school day and teachers, when necessary, will rotate to those classrooms. The students in those classrooms will eat lunch together. They will have a recess together. They will travel together to their special classrooms like the gymnasium when necessary. So the mitigation strategy for elementary, in addition to social distancing within the classroom, is to do our very best to keep cohorts of classrooms with each other for the majority of the day and limit to the fullest extent possible the intermingling of students across classrooms. That's possible in the elementary school because in the elementary level, the differentiation happens in the classroom. We don't have honors and AP level in fourth and fifth grade. That differentiation happens in different ways so we can maintain that cohorting. The secondary buildings require a different strategy, and that strategy is reducing the building load capacities and maintaining distancing. So hybrid scheduling um, may be the strategy that may be the strategy that we look at. We talked about the fact that that will be necessary, at least at the outset for the high school. Hybrid scheduling may also be the preferred model at the middle school, not only for social distancing, but for some other reasons that we're going to talk about later this evening. Or if enough students are online, then that natural reduction due to online learning may be enough that a hybrid schedule may not be necessary at the middle school level moving forward. But they are different strategies because at the secondary level, Students change class periods and they mix with different groups of students each class period as their needs are being met. So like we said, there are different levels of math classes or different levels of science classes. At the high school, students take different electives. Some are in our music programs, some are in our arts programs. So that cohorting model is really not a feasible option at the secondary level. Moving on to distancing. This is the same guidelines that we've all seen in our places of work, and these are the guidelines we've all come to know and the ones that are probably most common to all of us, that is six feet of distancing to the fullest extent feasible, reducing congregation in communal areas. When we have lunch, we will maintain six feet of physical distancing during lunch. We should use outdoor spaces to the extent that we can or other larger building spaces. So part of lunches may be split between the cafeteria and other large spaces. Put floor markings, have one-way hallways when that is an option. In some schools, it's actually better to have all traffic flow on the right-hand side with a marking in the middle and it be a two-way hallway as opposed to a one-way hallway. It's just dependent on the school in the given situation one-way stairwells as feasible. And another really important distancing measure that we've spent a lot of time looking into and will continue to do research on and gain best practice is really thinking about programs in which exhalation, so singing in choir, singing in our music classes, playing wind instruments in band, exerting oneself in physical education, those 
activities increase exhalation and the potential risk of airborne droplets. So we will be taking special protocols in all of those programs, which may include having to limit some of those programs for student safety. Hand hygiene is a significant strategy. There will be hand sanitizer in every classroom. There will be required regular use before and after each class. And we will limit the sharing of materials to the fullest extent. And when we can't limit the sharing of materials or if those materials are large, like the equipment used in certain classrooms, they will be sanitized between use. The next one is to limit all visitation as feasible. The district will be, to the fullest extent, limiting all visitors that are not absolutely necessary into the school buildings for the safety of students and staff each day when we return to in-person learning. And finally, face coverings. We're going to talk about this more in depth, but face coverings will be required for all students and staff at all times, with the exception of. So... Getting more in depth, as we know, face coverings has been a really significant concern on the part of students, staff, faculty, certainly families. So students and staff will be required to wear masks and face coverings at all times, including on the school bus. In the event a face covering needs to be replaced at school, each school has face masks available to ensure compliance with this requirement. Now, when we say at all times, that does not mean we won't schedule planned mask breaks for students where they can go outside, where they can be widely spread out in those larger spaces, and when they are eating lunch. Other than that, students will be required to have face coverings at all times. If a student or staff member, though, has a documented medical condition that would not allow them to wear a face mask in accordance with Section 504, with IDA, then they will be allowed not to wear that mask, but other safety precautions will be in place to maintain distancing. Staff members who have concerns with those face coverings and those requirements have already been informed of how we will work through that process through our Human Resources Department. Documentation of such conditions from families and staff will be requested for students, it will be in accordance with Section 504, IDEA, or their student's IEP. More specifics with regard to those distancing measures. So in the classrooms, desks will all face the same direction to the maximum extent. If they can't be pulled apart because of workstations, then students will be spaced as far apart as possible. They might sit on only one side of a table. They might sit on the end of a table but distancing will be to the fullest extent in classrooms. Locker use will be limited in each school, and the reason for that is between classes when students move, if students stop at lockers, it creates a lot of congregation, particularly at the high school where the hallways are very narrow. It's an unsafe condition. We are going to limit locker use. We may look into, so as someone mentioned, if there's the winter coat and there's the instrument and those things, students might be able to put something in the locker at the beginning of the day, then retrieve it at the end of the day without using the locker in between and during class changes. In the elementary school, uh, lockers may be used, but that's a more controlled environment. Classrooms can go out a few students at a time at the direction of teachers as they don't have class changes the way they do in the secondary level, but we are trying to avoid slow moving congregation in the hallway and unfortunately the lockers cause that to happen. Now to be honest, if you've been to Quaker Valley High School, you would know that most high school students don't use a locker at all. So they're used to that for Ella, or excuse me, for middle school students, we will have to make other arrangements to make sure that they can move about comfortably. Cafeterias, um, in the cafeteria, as mentioned, we will certainly have six feet of distancing in our cafeterias. Other auxiliary spaces might need to be used to serve lunch so that we can maintain that physical distancing. Classrooms would be utilized as a last resort, um, and we will uh, look to maintain other safety procedures in the cafeteria, 
Like we said, face coverings can come off while eating, but as they move about the cafeteria before students sit down, those face coverings should be on. And we will do our very best within the cafeteria to make the menu simple, to make lunches more grab and go style, set out utensils and other food items so that there's limited shared touching of any kind, things will be individually wrapped, and obviously we wanna limit exposure to the extent possible. In our special areas, we talked about planning ahead for those um, situations where there may be exhalation and sharing of equipment. At recess, um, as always, recess will be held outdoors whenever possible. Face coverings can be removed outdoors when distancing is appropriate. Masks will be worn for indoor recess and contactless activities, and we will do our very best to either reduce shared equipment or clean and sanitize shared equipment between use. With regard to large gatherings, as we know, we have restrictions within Allegheny County. We'll obviously follow those same protocols within schools. So large gatherings and events and co-curricular activities will be limited to maintain physical distancing. More than likely, concerts and performances will be limited or canceled unless there's a significant change in the pandemic. Clubs and activities, we hope to maintain as many clubs and activities as we can. We know how important those opportunities are for our students. They will follow the athletic health and safety plan and or meet virtually when possible. Student and staff travel, so for sports and field trips, will be significantly limited and only will occur when necessary or will be eliminated. Moving on to our next committee, we had the Student and Staff Health and Wellness Group. They looked first at the daily health assessments. This is a requirement. So our staff and families will need to commit to daily symptom assessments and the taking of temperatures. All students, staff, and anyone who reports to the school building should stay home, either if symptomatic, and symptomatic means symptoms aligned to COVID-19, or have a fever of 100.4 or higher. We know that the schools will need to have thermometers and the staff will check in on any students who may need assistance. So if we are aware that students might not be able to do that home assessment or are having trouble with that home assessment, for uh, various reasons, the school will assist in doing a check when students arrive. There will be training provided to all employees as to how to conduct that self-assessment and when to stay home and follow those flow charts if symptomatic. We will make those resources available to families as well. There is a COVID-19 decision tree that's part of the health and safety plan. There are flow charts that are in there so that you can see the protocols that will be followed for handling the exposure and or when those who test positive. Um, but as one mentioned, we will encounter a lot of scenarios that are not part of those flow charts. So we will have parents who will call us when they know a family member was exposed and maybe they were at that person's house or any other of a myriad of circumstances that may arise with regard to those exposures. The first thing we would ask anyone to do if unsure, stay home for at least one day, contact the school nurse in your building, ask those questions, ask what you should do, you always obviously have the opportunity to keep your students at home during COVID-19. We will have very flexible and caring attendance policies with regard to these matters as we will need to be nimble because we know many folks will have different things come up. So please use your school nurse as a resource. If and when in doubt, stay home for that day, contact the school nurse and we will provide information as to what the procedure should be uh, for you and your family to follow. Communication mechanisms are also in place. We will be notifying our school community and the Allegheny County Health Department when we have uh, confirmed cases and certain types of exposures so that the entire community is aware when we have COVID-19 present in our school environment. COVID-19 notification will look like this. So when a student or staff member in the district tests positive, staff and parents will receive written communication by email notifying them that a person in the school has tested positive. 
the information that was sent will contain necessary action steps to be taken and any recommendations provided. If individual communication is necessary, that will occur at the school level. So if there is a situation in an individual class or if there was certain exposure to individual students or staff, we will reach out and those communications will occur if there is exposure on an individual basis. Transportation and community partnerships looked at the various strategies that they could utilize to make things safer on our school vehicles. Obviously, minimizing ridership to the extent feasible helps to maintain physical distancing. As you saw from the earlier slide, we have a 70% plus commitment for families to transport their students. When on those school buses, we will keep the riders as far apart as possible. Face coverings both at the bus stop when six feet of distance is not possible and on buses will be a requirement. We will maximize ventilation on school vehicles. So all of our school windows have what's called a drip edge. So you can actually put the window down um, a fraction even while it's raining to maintain <coughs> ventilation. And there are hatch vents on the roofs of all of those vehicles that will also be opened to maintain airflow and ventilation on our school vehicles. School vehicles will be clean and sanitized regularly. The touch points and seats and whatnot will be wiped after each run and a thorough cleaning will be done in the morning and in the afternoon when runs have completed. And as mentioned, we'll be working closely with community partners to align those bus schedules and sharing of safety procedures and protocols and we will promote those daily health screenings for all of our riders when they board the bus. Remote learning. Remote learning and options and those things will be discussed uh, in more in depth this evening in the follow-up presentation after we finish presenting the health and safety plan. But that committee was charged with the following uh, that you see in front of you as the questions to be answered. How can we provide a fully online option for all K-12 students who elect not to return? How can we revise what took place in the spring with regard to remote learning to make it more robust? What options could we identify for different instructional models to address social distancing? How can we ensure equitable access to appropriate technology and curriculum resources? I am pleased to report um, now and we may discuss later that the district has already taken steps to procure Apple iPads for all students K through 12 for the upcoming school year. So originally our phased in technology plan only called for a grades three through five implementation this year, given the COVID pandemic and the fact that there were some grant funds available, uh, we decided as a district to recommend to the board procuring those devices uh, and they uh, saw the wisdom in making sure we would have that equitable access for all students should we have a full return to remote learning. Uh, we wanted to identify a process for ensuring that students and teachers are prepared to make a transition from face-to-face -to, -face to remote learning when necessary. We know that we need to be nimble and flexible. We could be in a return to remote uh, in a single day's notice. Provide the necessary personnel to support that shift. We talked about the iPads and making sure that we can provide equitable access and appropriate supports for all learners. So we have learners who have different needs. We have learners who have uh, needs that are supported by our student services department. And we need to ensure that even in a remote setting, we have strategies and plans in place to make sure access is equitable and that students are receiving all of the services um, that are due to be provided to them. And finally, the social and emotional wellness group, they looked at Instruction we can provide to all students in the area of social and emotional wellness. There is some degree of social and emotional wellness uh, that will be provided to all students. There is a new curriculum K through six that we'll be looking to pilot this year that has elements of social and emotional learning. The school-wide positive behavior support program that is already in place in our elementary and middle schools, those strategies will be looked at and they will be geared towards supporting students during this pandemic in various ways. And of course, counseling services will be available for all students, particularly those 
um, who are having an issue related to COVID-19. In our schools, we have a process called MTSS, the Multi-Tiered uh, Support System of Services, and we describe those tiers as a Tier 1 through Tier 3 system. So what this group has done, and they've done an excellent job, is they've looked at those supports we already have in place, and they have adapted those supports uh, to make sure that we can provide more intense uh, resources and more intense support for students specifically related to COVID-19. Tier 1 supports are supports that are for all of our students. Tier 2 is more for smaller groups. And Tier 3 is more intense individual uh, supports for those in need. And our social and emotional uh, group also looked at how they can modify and identify the referral system to consider COVID-19 related issues and make sure we can work through those processes to get students the services they need in an efficient manner. Specifically, we have two slides this evening and we've asked our Director of Student Services, Mr. Mike Lewis, to be with us this evening to talk through some of the things that his department has specifically been working on with regard to providing services during this COVID-19 situation. So if Mike is on the line, I will turn it over to Mike. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Serla. Um, our goal, both moving forward and as it has always been, is to meet every student where they are, and we will continue Lewis, to- are you muted? I am not. I should be unmuted. I can hear him very faintly. <clears throat> Hello? Mr. Lewis, we still can't hear you. I am unmuted on my end. I apologize. No, I, I don't think anybody can hear him. Yeah. Oh, I just, I actually just, I got a text that some of the folks on the call can hear me. Someone can hear him. We can't hear him in the, in the room. Okay. I can hear him. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll just assume he, so they're basically telling us they can hear him, so we'll just let him keep going. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm being told that everybody can hear me. More okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so thank you, everyone. As I was saying, um, our goal, both moving forward and as it's always been, is to meet every student where they are, and we will continue to use the IEP team process during this time, working collaboratively with input from our staff and families each step along the way to do just that. This is still obviously new territory for all of us, and I'm thankful that we have an amazing team of teachers, paraprofessionals, and of course, our parents and students. IEP teams will need to consider FAPE, free and appropriate education on a case-by-case -case basis in each instructional model that Quaker Valley will offer. If regression or lack of progress is present, the IEP team will identify opportunities for recovery, including additional, new, or different services and accommodations. PDE has identified this new process as COVID compensatory services, which differs from the regression that we would typically measure for students with disabilities to determine extended school year services. We are working with PDE and the Bureau of Special Education to finalize protocols for what that might look like. As a matter of fact, our next meeting is tomorrow morning where we will be coming together virtually across the Commonwealth to continue this conversation. If the district is required to transition to hybrid or full remote learning, we will look to schedule virtual conferences to discuss the contents of IEPs and modify individualized plans for students at that time. Again, FAPE must be honored and we will work with parents and guardians to determine the safest and best way to do so in order to meet individual student needs. Communication and transparency is going to be vital. As Mrs. Harris said earlier in our presentation, a district FAQ is being developed and will continue to provide clarity to our plan. But of course, with all of the unique needs and some of the specific <coughs> concerns that our parents have, I'm obviously open to having individual conversations with anyone who may have a concern about their child specifically and our plan to support them along the way. If we want to go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Our student services department, as you see, regardless of the instructional method that a family chooses, will continue to serve and support our students. Our team of psychologists, nurses, counselors, 
student assistance team, and our behavior specialist will all be available in both face-to-face -face or virtual formats for all students. As Dr. Uh, Serloff mentioned, we're going to be piloting a new social and emotional learning curriculum this year in grades K to six called Move This World, which we will be able to use in both person, in person, I'm sorry, and online modules. We're continuing our partnership with Holy Family to provide school-based counseling supports, and they will serve as a, an ongoing partner in our student assistance program. Students who have 504 plans will continue to receive supports necessary to be successful as well in the instructional method of their choosing. And our staff will be working closely with our students and families in those situations, and we will closely monitor, monitor individual student needs there as well. as well. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Serloff. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. So in addition to those committees and their respective plans that are contained within uh, the health and safety plan that we are proposing this evening, there are two appendices in that plan. The first is an updated athletic plan. Um, just to make note, the original uh, plan came online and was approved prior to the mask requirement in Pennsylvania. So we have updated the athletic and, uh, plan with, with that. We have also put a piece in there regarding activities and what the health and safety plan should be for those activities. Um, essentially, if it is an in-school, in-class type activity, they will follow the in-school safety protocol. If it is an outdoor activity, uh, such as a running club or something of that nature, they will follow the athletic health and safety plans. And like mentioned, when possible activities uh, will be conducted virtually. So that rounds out uh, the overview of the health and safety plan, the subcommittees and their work. Um, but we also have a few additional updates to share this evening with things um, related. So the first is um, we would like to just share with the community that we are reviewing the possibility of delaying the start of the school year. So if uh, it becomes necessary, we will make that recommendation to the Board of School of Directors to potentially delay the start of school um, for several reasons, um, some of it regarding the need to potentially hire additional personnel for the options, uh, the fact that we want to procure all of the technology devices so we have them available on day one to ensure training and that all new hires are up to speed uh, on where we were with remote learning. Um, the Quaker Valley teachers became really adept at using a lot of technology tools, particularly things like Schoology and Zoom, um, but we've hired several new teachers over the summer who have yet to begin their first day as a Quaker Valley employee, uh, and we need to make sure that those teachers are ready and prepared to instruct our students uh, when we open the school year. So we may be coming back to our board uh, with a plan to delay the start of the school year. The other thing uh, that could potentially push the start of the school year back, as you can imagine, would be the COVID-19 uh, data in Allegheny County, which could obviously change all of our plans at any time. Um, so for that reason, and because of all of the things we talked about with concerts and the potential that they'll be limited or canceled, we are holding off on printing the annual wall calendar for families until we have more information uh, so that that document comes out in an accurate way. There is the potential we could be electronic calendar only as we might need to be a little bit more flexible and nimble. As those updates occur, they will be communicated ASAP both through our communication mechanisms, emails, text, and whatnot that you are familiar with, as well as on our website, qvsd.org. Um, also launched today was the new returning to school webpage where a lot of the information that we are sharing this evening, a lot of the FAQ information that will be coming out over the next few days, additional publications and information that we will be sharing in the coming weeks will also be available there on the returning to school webpage. Um, before we move into the conversation of the board with regard to the plan and questions that they may have, um, as the pandemic coordinator, uh, a job um, I was certainly not prepared for in March, having not really even thought about having a school pandemic, but obviously things change. 
I am deeply indebted uh, to the 50 plus members uh, that you see in front of you from across this community and within our faculty and administration for doing a lot of hard work. They read a lot of documents, a lot of guidance. They provided a lot of assistance. Uh, they spent a lot of time meeting and sharing recommendations, revising recommendations, and keeping us up to date uh, on what they were finding and resources that they were finding uh, that they could share with us. So we are deeply grateful to all of you uh, that served and for those who will continue to serve as we are going to continue to need uh, stakeholder support and input as we revise plans and things change moving forward. Um, the last thing I would like to share is, as we heard, there was a lot of questions at the outset of this meeting. The document that is online is pretty dense. It's 65 pages long, and yet we still couldn't address every circumstance that we know we are going to encounter over the next few weeks. I can assure you our faculties, our building administration, our uh, district office administration are doing our very best to think through all of those scenarios and all of those things uh, that are going to be necessary to be planned uh, in all of those details, whether it is a student drop off, pick up locations, all of the logistics of operating an in-person environment, maintaining distancing, maintaining hygiene, all uh, under uh, less than ideal circumstances given this pandemic. So we will continue our work uh, in planning all of those details and sharing those with families when they are available. Um, so with that, I conclude. Um, like I said, thanks to all, and I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Andreco and to the board for questions or comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Serlop, and, and to all of our subcommittee members, our administration, and everyone who has participated.